1, estamos en vivo. En todo el mundo, los sistemas de salud luchan contra el aumento de los costos y la diferencia de calidad. Los diagnósticos y los tratamientos se diseñan teniendo en cuenta al paciente típico. Las prestaciones se fragmentan y enfocan en el volumen. El foco en la experiencia del paciente es incipiente y la atención médica aún no aprovecha al máximo el potencial de los datos. Para resumir, hay mucho trabajo por delante. Creemos que la medicina será más precisa y accesible, por lo que los diagnósticos serán precisos y los tratamientos se podrán adaptar a las características únicas de cada persona. Creemos que el valor será el núcleo de la atención médica, que se organizará en torno a la patología del paciente y se diseñará para reducir los costos sin sacrificar los resultados. Creemos que a los pacientes se los tratará como consumidores, participando en el manejo de su salud. Contarán con información, tendrán expectativas y tomarán decisiones. Creemos que la atención médica se digitalizará. Las tecnologías digitales cambiarán la naturaleza misma del bienestar y de la atención médica. Y creemos que juntos podemos modelar el futuro del cuidado de la salud. Buenas, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por acompañarnos en esta edición de nuestro Grand Round Virtuales, en esta oportunidad de radiología e, e intervencionismo. Les recordamos que al conectarse a esta conferencia la autorizan el tratamiento de sus datos personales, los cuales están tratados de acuerdo a la ley 1581 de 2012 y nuestras políticas de datos personales, las cuales se encuentran publicadas en la página www.org. De igual forma, esta conferencia está siendo grabada. El chat de las preguntas se encuentra habilitado en la barra de participantes y les agradecemos ahí sus inquietudes, las cuales intentaremos resolver al final de la sesión. Un especial agradecimiento en el día de hoy a Siemens, eh, quienes se vincularon como patrocinadores de esta actividad. Para iniciar, nos acompaña y tenemos el honor de contar con el doctor Jonathan Lexi y nos hablará en una conferencia desde el reemplazo valvular transcatéter de la válvula órtica hacia el reemplazo de la válvula mitral, 20 años de experiencia y de optimización de las imágenes en la evaluación del resultado previo a los implantes valvulares transcatéter. Buenas tardes a todos. El doctor Leipzig es director del Departamento de Radiología de Providence Healthcare Vancouver Coastal Health y subdirector de la, de la División de Investigación del Departamento de Radiología de la Universidad de British Columbia. Es profesor de Radiología y Cardiología de la Universidad de British Columbia. El doctor Leipzig también es director de Investigación para Canadá en Imágenes Cardiovasculares Avanzadas y tiene más de 570 publicaciones indexadas, más de 300 resúmenes científicos y es editor de dos libros de texto. Ha sido profesor invitado en más de 150 presentaciones en los últimos cuatro años. Fue presidente de la Sociedad de Escanografía Cardiovascular, la SCCT, en 2015-2016 y recibió la medalla de oro de esta sociedad en 2019. Además, fue incluido en 2019 en el prestigioso Top 1% de los científicos con mayor impacto en el mundo por Web of Science. Entonces, bienvenidos todos a esta charla que sin duda va a ser muy importante para todos. Uh, Dr. Leipzig, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. We're not hearing you. Your 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 mic is muted. Uh, am I unmuted now? Okay. There you go. All right. Hi, Muchas gracias for that very kind introduction and uh, for the opportunity. I wish I was there in person, but you know, in this COVID era, I'm glad to see you in good health and. And maybe one day we'll we'll uh, be able to do this in person. Uh, 
I, I was asked to talk about CT for structural heart disease, and this is a very broad topic now, but I tried to put together four or five areas that I really think are evolving and are important. Uh, as I know, you're growing your structural heart disease program in, in Colombia, in Bogota and beyond, and I think it's very exciting space. Um, before I get going, I do have some disclosures. Most of my disclosures relate to uh, the core lab work that we do. <clears throat> I take no personal compensation for that. We're the core lab for Edwards, Boston, Abbott, and Medtronic. So I think we would all agree the case for transcatheter aortic valve replacement is now uh, fairly overwhelming. You know, that doesn't mean that TAVR is the uh, procedure of choice for all patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, but it certainly means that for the majority of patients, particularly if their CT anatomy is reasonable, that TAVR is, is the method of uh, choice for treating severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. These are data from the Intermediate Risk Trial of uh, Edwards Life Sciences published back in 2016 in The Lancet, where we looked at patients who uh, were intermediate risk for surgery between three and 7% STS risk score. And you can see the downstream clinical outcomes. You know these data are, were better with TAVR than with surgery. Building on that, uh, we saw the low risk data published back in 2019 in the New England Journal, both Medtronic and Edwards, showing that when we looked at a composite endpoint in low risk patients, that TAVR was superior to SAVR. In, when it came to heart endpoints, there was equivalency. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the outstanding challenges though. Many people will say that, look at this data, you should simply do TAVR in all patients. But the reality is what we learned from these data is that CT plays an essential role in screening patients as to whether or not they're the uh, whether or not uh, TAVR is the appropriate uh, means or method or procedure of choice to resolve aortic stenosis. And I'll come to why that is. At the end of the day, surgical risk score is not what's defining the risk of the patient for TAVR. It's really the patient-specific anatomy of annular uh, uh, subannular calcification, low coronary height adverse root features. These are features that are uniquely and, and consistently identified on CT that help us understand patient-specific risk. Excuse me, in the, in the mitral space, we know that there's a lot of interest as well, and we were talking about this a moment ago, not only as it relates to mitral clip and clasp, uh, as we saw from COAP to mitral FR, as it relates to functional mitral regurgitation, but also transcatheter mitral valve replacement. There are a number of devices that have now been deployed in patients, and in fact, the the uh, 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 the um, Medtronic device, the Intrepid device, has been deployed in over 250 patients. Uh, we see the Tendine device, which was purchased by Abbott, has been deployed in well over 250 patients. So there's growing experience with these devices, and I think as we're confronted with patients with mitral insufficiency, we need to learn further how to integrate imaging into the decision making. Now, the downstream outcomes for transcatheter mitral valve replacement are obviously much more modest. We have in large randomized trials. These are data from the Abbott experience with the Tendine device for which we served as the core lab. You can see that out past a year that patients who underwent transcatheter mitral valve replacement with a Tendine device had uh, eradication of the mitral insufficiency. That much we know, uh, but the downstream outcomes were still more modest than certainly with TAVR. I think it speaks somewhat to patient selection and really understanding who is going to derive benefit from these procedures, and certainly that's a, a subject for ongoing investigation. But let's focus on these few topics that I uh, that I wanted to really focus on this morning or this afternoon, and the first one is mitral annular calcification. I don't know what to, to what extent that you're performing transcatheter uh, valve and MAC, but certainly this concept of relieving mitral stenosis in the setting of severe MAC with either a uh, Edwards uh, balloon expandable uh, aortic device or perhaps the Lotus device from Boston Scientific is being considered. Now we know that the mitral annulus can be segmented with CT. We tried to show that a number of years ago that CT's real strength is providing an anatomical evaluation of the landing zone, understanding where the device will co-opt, understanding the risk of annular injury in the aortic position, understanding the risk of LVOT obstruction in the mitral position. And while we can do this in a highly reproducible way, 
even in a fashion similar to the way Bob Levine taught us 30 years ago, this concept of the saddle-shaped annulus, we can, of course, segment this saddle-shaped annulus using routine uh, reconstruction algorithms, either manual multiplanar reformats or facilitated algorithms that allow us to define the posterior mitral shelf, the location of the posterior mitral annular insertion, the trigones, and then even the um, uh, anterior horn sloping up to the root of the aorta. And while we can do this, and we've shown that we can do this in a reproducible way uh, using tools such as uh, Circle or Threemencio, or even as we published in radiology a couple of years ago, manual multiplanar reformats, really simply using a basic uh, multiplanar tool, either from your Siemens workstation or GE workstation, or in this case, Terra Recon, and really define the D-shaped annulus, the true landing zone of the transcatheter mitral valve device, defined again by the posterior uh, insertion of the mitral valve, as well as the trigones, the fibrous uh, trigones of the, uh, of the nadir of the mitral annulus. While this is very robust and I think reproducible and established, I would argue that these, this concept for valve and MAC is limited. And the reason it is, is because of the complexity of mitral annular calcification. We know that MAC is a really heterogeneous disease. We've learned this over the years, certainly in the transcatheter aortic valve space, in the balloon valvuloplasty space, and now in the timber space, is that there are areas of calcification that are very dense, there's protruding calcium, there's areas of caseous calcification, so-called liquid or cheesy calcium that's more like a uh, perhaps softer, and all of these patterns of calcification undoubtedly provide different counterbearing forces. So when we think about any transcatheter intervention, as I see uh, looking at uh, an interventionalist in front of me, what, what am I thinking? I'm thinking what he has to worry about is that the valve doesn't embolize and the valve doesn't leak. You know, that the valve stays there and the valve co-ops properly and seals. Without coaptation and sealing, it's not a successful procedure. And so the challenge with valve and MAC is we have many issues. One is, will the valve actually hold? Will the MAC provide adequate counterbearing forces to actually hold the valve? And then the second issue, which is equally profound, is will it leak? How will these protruding nodules of calcium interact with the transcatheter device that we're putting in place? And will there in fact be leak around it? We spent quite some time trying to understand this, and I don't think there's any great answers. What I will tell you is that when we're segmenting these mitral annually with MAC, we really do harken back to the aortic position. If you're segmenting a three-dimensional structure with areas of calcification, I think ultimately, before anything else, we need to be reproducible. If I'm informing a procedure for my interventional colleague, if I don't provide a reproducible measure, then what I my report is useless because if you wait till tomorrow, I'm going to give you a different answer. So first and foremost, we have to be consistent. And I think to be consistent, what we need to do is almost ignore the calcium and try to define the harmonious segmentation of what we expect to be the mitral annulus and provide a reproducible measure that allows us to then integrate that measurement into device selection. Beyond that, we worked with uh, Myra Guerrero uh, who's at Mayo Clinic now, but she was at the time uh, in, in, in the Chicago area with Ted Feldman, and she proposed a score. And I think this score is not where we're going to be in five years, but it's it moves us forward. And that score really focuses on the thickness of the calcium, the calcium distribution, the trigonal involvement, and the leaflet involvement. And her focus here is less around leak and more around capture. So will the valve embolize? As we look here, it really refers to the thickness of the uh, calcium, the extent of the calcium, the trigonal involvement, whether or not there's calcium involving the trigones, as we see here, and the leaflet involvement. And the idea is the higher the score, the greater the likelihood that the valve will capture, the lower the score, the greater the risk of embolization. Here you could see, based on uh, the experience of the core lab work that we supported with her, is that if the score was uh, low, uh, the, the risk of embolization was significantly higher. If you look at the migration rate uh, as it relates to the max score, when the score was below six, there was a significant uh, rate of migration. Now, granted, the cohort size is small, but you could see here when the max score is uh, low, the, the rate of embolization or migration is higher than we would accept. 
when we see that the max score is high, there's still the chance of migration, but you're, you're much more likely to be successful. So not a perfect, perfect uh, uh, additional tool, but I think it helps us move the needle, as we say, to move us to have a better understanding on how to treat these patients with uh, severe mitral annular calcification. The second thing I wanted to focus on was uh, evolving understanding around complications. You know, we've spent many years now understanding risks of coronary occlusion in TAVI, where we worry about the, obviously the height of the coronary artery and the capacity of the sinus. We looked at annular rupture risk in TAVI, and we identified about seven years ago that severe subannular calcium was a driver of risk. But what other procedures should we focus on? So I wanted to turn our attention to valve and valve procedures. I'm not sure how many you're doing in the aortic position. For us here in Vancouver, it's about a third of our overall structural valve intervention. So it's really quite common. And we've learned a lot over the years from Danny DeVere, who's back in Tel Aviv, but spent three years with us in Vancouver, about the risks of valve and valve uh, procedure in the aortic position. He always taught me that the risks are really threefold. One is embolization, and our procedural colleagues have gotten better about that, so embolization is less likely. The second is gradient. We know the gradient is driven by putting a valve too low. You know, the valve is too, valve is too low, the gradient is high. Uh, and then um, the, the third issue, of course, is coronary occlusion. And that is where I think CT can really help us. How do we get a patient who has a bioprosthetic aortic valve? How do we use CT to better help plan the procedure and reduce the risk of coronary occlusion? So we'll talk about that. Before we talk about that, I wanted to highlight recent data published from the Vivid Registry looking at long-term outcomes. And you can see that there's a significant uh, mortality still of patients. As we follow patients out to eight years, the survival is not what we would want it to be, right? Now, that being said, if you look at the Vivid Registry and the original patients that were then being followed for eight years, these were patients that were too high risk for surgery and they would have been traditionally denied surgery. So, you know, to imagine that 60% would be dead at eight years is probably not that surprising. But what we also see is something that we saw early on as well, is that valve and valve in a small bioprosthesis, if you have a small bioprosthesis, the, the, the mortality is even higher. Right, The gradients are higher post-procedurally because they often have patient prosthesis mismatch, but also we, this is associated with a higher mortality out to eight years. But let's turn our attention back to what my job is as a CT imager, and that's to help John Webb and my colleagues here in Vancouver make sure they don't occlude the coronary. So when we think about coronary occlusion, the mechanism of coronary occlusion is different in valve and valve than in native TAVI. In valve and valve, it relates to putting a transcatheter valve in a failed surgical prosthesis and then forcing the leaflets of the surgical prosthesis open and wedging them against the uh, bioprosthetic stent posts. That essentially forms a covered stent in the root of the aorta. The problem with that is that if the sinuses are small, that covered stent may result in almost no flow to the coronary ostia. Or if the surgical valve is tilted towards one coronary ostia, that covered stent could potentially block flow to that coronary artery. So with that in mind, how do we use CT for tab or valve and valve? So the first thing that we do is we understand this concept of, of this virtual ring to coronary ostial distance. We first determine, is the valve itself a, 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 a stented prosthesis? If it is, we consider doing a measurement called the virtual ring to coronary osteal distance. We define the center aspect of the bioprosthesis, which we've done here. We hover over the crosshairs, and then we rotate around, and we move our way up to the level of the coronary arteries, and we simulate a virtual transcatheter heart valve based on that transcatheter heart valve size that we intend to deploy. And we then measure the distance between this virtual transcatheter heart valve to the coronary ostia. Now, the real question is, and we'll come back to how we measure that, the real question is, why do we measure that? Well, let's take a step back. <clears throat> 
let's imagine we don't know. Say the patient had surgery in Vancouver and the, and the patient says, you know, I'm tired of the rain. I want to go somewhere beautiful. I want to go to the real Colombia, not British Colombia. I want to go to Colombia. I want to have nice weather and I want to enjoy the beaches of Cartagena. And so they move to, to, to Colombia and they come to your institution and you don't have any surgical history. You don't know what type of valve it is. So how can CT help us? Well, the first thing we could do is similar to the way you do it for fluoro. You can fluoro the valve and get a sense of what the valve is, but we can also use CT for that. You could do a CT and we published a number of years ago a guidance document that provides you the, how the images look like of all the valves so that you could say, OK, this patient was in Vancouver and they had a Perimount 2700 valve or a Perimount Magna and you can help identify the valve. Now you may say, OK, I can do that with fluoro, though. Why would I really use CT? And here are just some other examples of what they look like. The mosaic where you have these uh, it almost looks like a floating valve, the Soren uh, Soprano, the mitra flow with its sort of undulating appearance. But beyond that, what we learned, what we can add value on is say you know the type of valve, but you still don't know what size valve it is. So if you want to determine what uh, valve to put in, you need to know the size because we determine how to put in what size valve to put in the valve based on the app, the valve and valve app that we use provided by Vinnie Papat. But you have to then say, OK, it's a Perry Mount valve, but is it a 23 or 25 or 27 millimeter valve? And you don't know because the patient came from Vancouver. So what one of our former fellows did in a very pragmatic way was we took all of these valves, we have a tissue registry, and we did CTs on them of all the valves that are typically used, and we just measured them in a consistent way. We measured in the center aspect of the, the metal frame, and we get measurements that allow us to give us area measurements and mean diameter measurements that allow clear separation between the sizes. So now imagine you have a patient that came from Vancouver with a Perimount 2900. You know it's a Perimount 2900, but you don't know the size. You do the CT on the patient and you could say, okay, is the area of the, of the valve, is it uh, 4.8 centimeters squared or five centimeters squared? It's probably a 25. Oh, it's four centimeters squared or 3.8. It's probably a 23. And now with that knowledge, you can then turn your attention to the app and go into the app and say, OK, I have a patient with a 25 millimeter Perimount 2900. What size valve should I put in? So already CT is helping us identifying the type of the valve and probably the size of the valve. And of course, this is only relevant if you don't know that. But if you don't know it, it can help you. The next thing we have to do then is understanding the type of valve. Is it stented or stentless? If it's stentless, then the whole mechanism of coronary occlusion, everything I mentioned about this virtual ring to coronary osseal distance isn't relevant. If it's stentless, you really just need to determine is the coronary artery above, uh, it, will it be above the, uh, how high is the coronary arteries? On the other hand, if it's stented, if the coronary arteries are above the stent posts, then you're not going to occlude because the mechanism of occlusion is not the transcatheter heart valve. It's the sealed, it's, it's the covered stent formed by the stent, by the stent posts of the surgical valve. So if the coronaries are above the surgical valve, it's uh, no problemo, right? It's not a problem. It's not an issue. Uh, but if it's below, then we have to measure the virtual ring to coronary osteal distance. And so again, what we need to do is we need to then look, is it stent posts of the surgical valve? Are the coronaries above it? It's not going to occlude the coronaries. If the stent posts are above the coronary arteries, then we need to measure, sorry, if it's, it's mixed up here. If, it's a, if the coronaries are below the stent posts, then we need to measure the virtual ring to coronary osteal distance. Again, we do the measurement as described and we put in that virtual ring based on the intended valve size and we measure the virtual ring to coronary osteal distance. Now, this is an example of a 25 millimeter magna, magna. We intend to put in a 26 millimeter valve. We look at the center aspect of these posts. We draw a 26 millimeter ring and we measure the distance. And that distance is five millimeters to the left, eight to the right. And then we simply track up to the sinotubular junction as well, because if this STJ narrows and the posts go above the STJ, then you could in fact occlude even at the sinotubular junction.
What have we learned? We've learned that when the virtual ring to coronary osteal distance is below four millimeters, the risk of coronary occlusion is significantly elevated. Here you could see two patients with mitral flows. This case, very high risk. This case, very low risk. So patient-specific risk defined by CT. And we learned this in actually in partnership with Enrique Ribeiro, who's back in uh, Sao Paulo, but he was in Quebec. They collected cases of uh, valve and valve where they experienced occlusion. And we in Vancouver, we measured all these cases. We measured the ones with occlusion and without. And we found that the virtual ring to coronary osteal distance is the single most predictive uh, measure to determine risk of coronary occlusion. If it's above four, the likelihood of occlusion is very, very low. If it's above six, it never almost happens. So it's a way of using CT to identify patient-specific risk of coronary occlusion. Now, a lot of attention now about basilica, you know, and, and people are pursuing this electrocautery surgeries to help mitigate the risk of coronary occlusion. The question is how can CT help us? Uh, the whole concept for those of you who are unaware of Basilica is that they puncture the leaflet of the surgical bioprosthesis and they provide, create a loop and they cauterize down and open up, the, uh, they tear the leaflet. In doing so, they open up the cells of the transcatheter heart valve and improve flow to the coronary artery. Here you could see a basilica of a, a sapient in a, uh, in a surgical valve here, an evolute R in a surgical valve. And so what we've learned is, is that CT can help us understand whether or not this is possible. We can provide the fluoroscopic angles, and there are a couple of papers I don't delve into here that are online now that show how you can use CT to provide the angles to allow our interventional colleagues to properly uh, penetrate and, and, and lacerate the leaflet. But the other simple thing we do is we look at where the posts are and where the middle portion of the surgical leaflet is in relation to the coronary artery. Because you can imagine that right now the proceduralist can only slice the middle of the surgical leaflet. So if the coronary artery is way off to the side and you're cutting here, it's not going to really help coronary flow a lot. So here you could see you cut here, here's the coronary, that degree of offset is relevant to our interventional colleagues. And so these are the measurements that we're providing routinely to determine whether or not this laceration will in fact help with coronary flow. Uh, and here's just, sorry, an example. Oh, darn it. It's my one video. It's not playing. But here you could see very high risk anatomy. The virtual ring to coronary osteal distance is very small, but they did a basilica and they maintained flow to the coronary artery. Now, what are the outcomes with Basilica? I think this is needs a lot more uh, expansion and knowledge. Danny presented this at EuroPCR. I think it's in press or in print. But what we see is that Basilica itself is still associated with a fairly high mortality, particularly double Basilica. Major stroke is a concern. So, you know, I don't think personally right now this is really, you know, we need to learn a lot more. What other things are my friends looking at in the in the procedural lab? Looking at other devices to help risk reduce the risk of coronary occlusion. This was uh, looking at the uh, accurate valve, not the, uh, the sorry, the uh, J valve, which is coming down from above and has is meant for AI. But what they're looking at here is whether or not they can use these gra graspers that come from above to grab the surgical leaflet and pull it away from the coronary ostia. And here you could see that this would have been the the. Uh, uh, positioning of the surgical leaflet had they not used this J valve and now with the J valve they're pulling that leaflet away just a little bit to help reduce the risk of coronary obstruction. So how about LVOT obstruction? This is also a concern as it relates to transcatheter mitral valve. We learned over the years that LVOT obstruction is um, is occurring primarily because of displacement of the anterior leaflet as well as the anterior border of the transcatheter valve. The LVOT becomes elongated by the uh, deployed device. I don't know why this is showing up so poorly, but what you could see here is that we were doing a virtual simulation in this case of a valve and MAC, and you could see by deploying a virtual uh, sapien device, we look in diastole, we look at systole, we draw the center line of the expected path of flow. There's very little room for this device. So what we've learned is that CT can help us predict our ri the risk by doing this virtual implantation, 
drawing a center line along the path of the blood as it would leave the left ventricle and measuring the residual LVOT area. What we learned from Didi Wong from uh, Henry Ford is that if the LVOT, neo-LVOT is below 1.8 centimeters squared, the risk of coronary occlusion is significantly elevated. And that's actually been built upon by the group from Cedars. This is actually published in 2019 that the single most important predictor of LVOT obstruction in valve and valve, in valve and ring, or in valve and MAC is this neo-LVOT from CT that we proposed a number of years ago. So if this neo-LVOT is small, the risk of coronary occlusion is significantly elevated. And this is just highlighting that again. Now, many people ask us though, how do we measure the LVOT? Do we measure it in diastole? Do we measure it in systole? And this is an important question. Historically, we measured in end systole. You can imagine that would be very conservative because the ventricle is emptied. It's at its narrowest, uh, its smallest, and the LVOT is going to be the smallest. So as an imager, if I want to make sure no one has a bad outcome, I take the most conservative measure. The problem is it results in a lot of patients being excluded from the procedure. So what we learned here from Vinnie Bapat and, and Chris Maduri using the Intrepid device is that end systole, the LVOT is the smallest, early systole, it's the largest. It's probably a blend of measurements that's relevant. So this is probably too conservative. This is probably too liberal, so to speak, you know, that uh, that we're saying, hey, it's it's always safe. But by looking at the dynamism of the LVOT, doing this virtual implantation, we can get a better assessment of patient specific risk. And so that's where we've moved. We really look at early systole all the way through late systole to understand patient specific risk. I want to focus now on two last things, bicuspid valve disease as well as uh, HALT, hypoattenuating leaflet thickening. So we've all seen the Seavers classification for bicuspid valve disease over a decade old, really focusing on the presence or absence of a RAFE. A RAFE is not fusion of the cusps, as you know, but rather incomplete separation. The cusps never separate. As a result, if there's a RAFE, it's rudimentary, a incomplete separation or non-separation, and you have this residual tissue. Now, to distinguish this RAFE from a fusion of two cusps, the RAFE by definition is rudimentary and does not extend up to the sinotubular junction. That is, I think, a very important teaching point from CT that we can look at and really identify consistently, and I'll show you that in a moment. But this, this Seavers classification was very helpful in the early days of, of, of understanding surgical anatomy. But I think over time, we need to extend beyond that and we need to learn from CT. Now, I'm sure we would all agree this is a type 1 bicuspid. There's a se severely calcified raphe. If we scroll up, this calcified raphe will stop and you'll see two commissures here and no tissue here. This is a case that's not a good candidate for TAVI because of the severity of the raffle calcium. But over time, we realize there's other patterns of apparent bicuspidity, whether we call it asymmetric cusp fusion here, where we have non-opening of these two cusps, but a residual commissure, but not a fulminant raphe. In other words, this tissue will extend up to the STJ, and it will there will be residual small opening of the commissure, but largely fusion of the two other cusps. These are patients that undergo TAVI with really out of uh, a complication. Here are some additional examples. You can appreciate there's calcium between these two cusps, but do you see here there's a residual commissure? So this patient probably has congenital uh, incomplete separation of these two cusps where there's separation here, but it doesn't separate all the way. As a result, there's a fibrous bridge between these two cusps where the calcium begins, gets deposited over time. Whereas in senile tricuspid aortosclerosis, if you look at CT, the calcium is almost always on this side because there's nothing bridging between the two cusps. So this is what we call asymmetric cusp fusion or a functional bicuspid with a residual commissure. We provided guidance in our SCCT guidelines, uh, and you can look at that. And I think that we really tried to drive home. If you look at a CT and you want to know, is this a completely... Is this asymmetric cusp fusion with a residual commissure, or is this a complete raphe bicuspid valve, raffle bicuspid valve? The key is the raphe does not extend up to the level of the sinotubular junction, 
excuse me, which is a true distinguishing characteristic to a non-opening or asymmetric cusp fusion. So what you do is you create um, a short axis view of the uh, leaflets of, or the cusp of the aortic valve. You scroll down, you scroll up, and you'll see disappearance of the rudimentary raphe before you get to the level of the sinotubular junction. So the question is, can CT then help us understand patient-specific risk? And this is a really important work that was led by the CEDARS group that came out in Jack, I think about a month ago. What they did was they collected 1,100 uh, patients who had undergone CT for TAVR uh, with bicuspid valves uh, and underwent TAVR. And what you could see here is in the absence of a RAFE, uh, you, you could see here non-raffle bicuspid valve, you could see the presence of a RAFE and then a calcified RAFE, and then extent and severity of leaflet calcification. And what they found was that there are about 45% of patients that have a calcified RAFE, either with or without severe leaflet calcification, which is important to start. There are many patients though, about 40% of patients that have RAFE, but no calcium in the RAFE or minimally calcified RAFE. Why does this matter? Well, what they showed us is that if you have a severely calcified RAFE, these are the patients that probably should not undergo TAVR. Their risk of annular injury or sinus injury is very high. It's roughly two times that of those without RAFE calcification. Similarly, if they have excessive leaflet calcium, the risk is about 1.7 fold higher. And if you have both the relative risk is even higher yet. If you have calcified raphe and excessive leaflet calcium, the relative risk is roughly threefold higher. So we're using CT to characterize the aortic valve morphology. Is it a functional bicuspid? Is it a congenital bicuspid with a raphe? That is important. And then beyond that, is the raphe heavily calcified or not? Uh, and that really helps us identify whether or not the patient is a good candidate for TAVR or not. Beyond identifying these patients, how do we size for bicuspid valves? So some people, including Niccolo Piazza from uh, McGill, he's a good friend of mine, very smart guy. He's saying that we shouldn't measure for bicuspid valves the way we do for tricuspids, measuring at the annular plane. He says we should measure up high at the level of the superannular level defined by the commissures, the actual opening commissures. I'm of the opinion that we shouldn't shift our practice yet, and I'll tell you why. The first reason is we have good evidence that sizing bicuspid valves using traditional methods leads to good outcomes. There'll be a presentation by my colleague John Webb uh, at TCT based on the registry from the uh, partner data bicuspid, good outcomes using our sizing methods of the annular level. The other reason again is a measurement needs to be reproducible to be relevant. So if Nico is saying we should measure in this fashion, we did a small study where we had an interventionalist, an echo person, uh, uh, and a CT person measure, or two CT people and an interventionalist measure at the superannular level and look at the measurements. They're non-reproducible. So before I shift my practice to measure at the superannular level, I have to show it to be reproducible because how can you guide sizing if the measurement's going to be all over the map? The final thing I wanna share, if I have a, just a few more moments, is to talk about valve degeneration. I'm sure you've all heard of this uh, ruckus and, and, and interest about uh, so-called HALT, hypoattenuating lethal thickening. But before I focus on HALT, I think it's important that we recognize that there are many things that can cause abnormality on surgical and transcatheter heart valves on CT. One is focal thrombus. The other is panis or fibrosis, which is circumferential at the inflow of the valve, which occurs over time, right? That is not halt or thrombus, that's panis. And then of course, calcification, which is probably the end stage of valve degeneration. Now, if we turn our attention to halt, the, the saga of halt is five years old. We I know that we can identify hypoattenuating leaflet thickening on transcatheter and surgical valves at a week, at a month, at a year after TAVR and SAVR. What we don't know is what does it mean? So what does HALT look like? HALT is meniscoid in shape. It's thickest at the base. It extends to the tip. That is HALT. If it's thickest at the tip and sh uh, thinnest at the base, that is not HALT. That could be a vegetation. That could be something else, but that's not hypoattenuating leaflet thickening. How do we identify HALT? Well, first we need to understand what uh, a normal transcatheter valve looks like, and we have to have good image quality. When we image for HALT, uh, 
After TAVR, we rate control our patients. The patients don't have aortic stenosis anymore. So we give them beta blockade. If we're trying to look for thrombus, we reduce the heart rate, maybe not below 60, but we try to get it below 70 for sure. And then you have to do full cardiac cycle to look at the motion of the leaflets. And our focus is again thickening first. People say, do you look for restriction of motion? For CT, the temporal resolution is not as good as echo. So we should first look for thickening. If there's no thickening, I don't call restriction because CT doesn't have the temporal resolution to call that. We need to understand artifacts. We sometimes get these streaky artifacts that can make it difficult. These streaky artifacts will go along the plane or the angle of the, of the, of the stent struts and they will not layer on the leaflet itself. This is not HALT, this is artifact, these dark areas. You really wanna see a meniscus-like appearance starting at the base extending to the tip. This is what HALT looks like. It's thickest at the base, it extends to the tip. And another take home point for me is that it's not a binary diagnosis. You can have minimal HALT on one leaflet or you can have extensive thickening on multiple leaflets. This is a very different uh, probable clinical relevance. Here you could see one leaflet, very minimal HALT, right? This is on the non-coronary cusp. Here's the intervalvular fibrosa, focal thickening just at the base of the non-coronary cusp. So this is the classic appearance. What do we suggest? First of all, we don't believe you should go looking for it. If you have a patient with a rising gradient, if you have a patient with a new onset heart failure, if you have a patient with a stroke or a peripheral vascular accident, you do a CT. We don't go looking for HALT because we know it's going to be present in 15% of patients after TAVR and probably 10% after SAVR. But we don't know if we should be anticoagulating people. In fact, we learned from, of course, Galileo uh, that if we anticoagulate all of these patients, we may be causing harm, right? So we don't have evidence to do anything about incident until he identified HALT. If we do identify HALT though, we should report it in a reproducible and consistent way. And this is how we propose. We measure the leaflets one to four, one, two, you know, based on the extent, a score of one, two, three, and four, and then the number of leaflets. So this is what we recommend. We don't recommend that we do CT following TAVR. We should consider it in the setting of clinical concern, of valve degeneration or infective endocarditis. And if we do do it though, we should describe the extent and severity of HALT. You know, this is valve thrombosis, right? This is minimal HALT. These are very different patients. Lastly, do we comment about restriction again? You see the problem with CT is there's temporal averaging, right? Even if you have a Siemens dual source scanner, has excellent temporal resolution, the temporal resolution is still less than that of echo. So sometimes you can look at, at late systole and think that this leaflet is restricted, but you actually look in mid systole and you can see that the leaflet is actually opening. So first we look for thickening, that is the strength of CT. If there's no thickening, we don't call restriction. If there's thickening, we then look to see whether or not there's restriction. Why else could we have thickening on CT? Again, not everything with thickening is HALT. We can have thickening at the base of the inflow. It can be circumferential. It can extend up the actual stent. This is panis. This is not gonna to respond to anticoagulation. This of course doesn't, you don't see it at a week or a month. This takes time to develop. Another example of extensive panis, starting at the inflow and then extending up the transcatheter valve. And then finally, in the setting of someone with a fever, but you can see even without the fever, if I said to you, is this HALT? No, it's thinnest at the base, it's thickest at the tip. This is not HALT. In this case, this is a target lesion. This is a vegetation. So what do we know about HALT? We know it's fairly common. There are two papers. Uh, we were the core lab for both the uh, Edwards and the Medtronic data post-implant. What did we find? That post-TAVR, it was more common in, in, the, in the TAVR arm in the Edwards trial than in the, sorry, in the Edwards trial than in surgery at 30 days. But at one year, it was pretty similar. Halt. These were blinded red. So the, the sites didn't treat, they didn't give anticoagulation. And in the Medtronic trial, what we could see is the rate of halt was fairly similar between TAVR and surgery at, uh, at uh, 30 days and at one year. So the rate is between 10 and 20%, and it's maybe a bit more in TAVR, but not a lot more. 
And what we also know is, again, it's not a binary diagnosis, right? We can have very minimal t halt like this, or we can have extensive thrombus like this. This is a very different clinical scenario. What are the impacts on clinical outcomes? It's mixed. We have data from Raj Makar at Cedars and the group from uh, uh, Copenhagen that would suggest that HALT is associated with a higher TIA rate, but I'm not so sure. It never has been borne out in other data sets. This is data also from Denmark and Germany. No, uh, no negative outcome out to four years in the German data set, whether they had, whether there was no HALT or uh, when you look at, sorry, no uh, leaflet thickening or leaflet thickening as it relates to mortality or stroke. And similar, these are data from uh, Aarhus, Denmark. No signal for stroke or mortality for HALT at all. So I think we need to learn a lot more. I think what we really want to know is, is HALT maybe an inciting event that could drive structural valve degeneration? The group from uh, Quebec showed us that about 5% of patients have structural valve degeneration premature, prematurely after transcatheter heart valve. And maybe the 10% of patients that have HALT could be more represented amongst those patients, but we don't know. And so we're looking to explore that. We're looking at explanted valves and really trying to understand the relationship between thrombus and fibrosis and calcification. And we did interestingly find on these explanted TAVI valves that you never had calcification, which is of course the end stage of degeneration without fibrosis, and you never had fibrosis without thrombus. So we don't know if you develop thrombus if you are going to degenerate, but we know you don't degenerate without at least having thrombus in the beginning. So there's much more to learn. I'm going to stop there because uh, the pet stuff is getting a bit out there, but I will uh, close there and really just thank you for the opportunity um, uh, to share some of my ideas uh, and really uh, uh, to join you today to talk about the role of CT for structural heart disease. You know, we just scratched the surface. There's so much more we could talk about, but I look forward to your questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. It's, been, it's been amazing. Now what I'll do is uh, try to um, have the questions uh, that are that have related subjects. So let's start with the uh, with the aortic valve. Okay. So let's see. so when you report uh, a halt, you use it with a one to four degree based on the percentage and which leaflets have that percentage, right? That, that's the way you put it in your in your report. That's what you tell to your patient. Yes. So exactly. So we would imagine that there could be a score of one to twelve, and we actually have some data that's being under review now, which I think is important that the reason we also want to do that is uh, 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 Jaime, uh, I forget your last name, I'm sorry, but doctor, you're the physician beside you. I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, if I say to him, this patient has HALT and the score is one, the agreement between me and my colleague is only a cap of about 0 0.7, 0 0.65. It's not great. If I say the HALT is six, that's the agreement is almost 100% that the patient has fairly extensive halt. So it's important not only to grade it, but because it also probably helps us understand how confident we can be that they even has the diagnosis. Okay, perfect. How often do you repeat those CTs to figure out if the treatment is working? Because, you know, the, these CTs have more radiation. Those are full dose during the whole cardiac cycle, right? These are not coronary CTAs. These are, yeah. these are this is another animal. I mean, this yeah. is a different kind of, of, of scan. Sometimes you have to use 120 kV or 120 sure. kV. I mean, it's not the same uh, 80 or in kV sure. uh, scan sure. that you do for coronaries, but you restrict the thing. You, you can use prospective this and that. This is a different thing. Sure. Um, repeating those scans to follow up, halt, or I mean, any other thrombin. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that's so on point for two reasons. The radiation dose is a concern, of course, although these are generally obviously older patients, but also the contrast. You know, I mean, we do, you know, we have older patients and while I'm not worried about doing a preset TAVR CT in most patients, even if they have depressed renal function, because I know the CT helps so much, but I would not advocate doing CT after just for screening for HALT for that reason. It just, it doesn't help. If on the other hand, you have a patient who has rising gradient and you're worried that they've developed thrombus, I would do the CT and I would anticoagulate and we repeat the CT. And I'm not 
and I'm not terribly worried because I think it's really helping the patient. We need to know is the is the gradient going down or if there's some outstanding concerns, I would repeat it, but not just to follow it because of interest. You know, do we see halt or do we not see halt? That's why we don't do. And Dr. Webb and my said he's never requested because we just felt it was not appropriate to just go looking for halt uh, just out of curiosity. So if there's no symptoms, no gradient, no worsening uh, 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 condition of the patient, we don't we don't do uh, uh, imaging. Okay. The first reports that we read about using the density to dis to differentiate between panus and uh, rhombus, this yeah. uh, ratio. Uh, do you use that at all, or is it just a morphologic thing? Because sometimes the morphology is of a uh, thrombus, but the density doesn't give you, or, or the other yeah. way around. Yeah. Um, what do this, you think of those? Reports? Yeah, this is a very thoughtful question, and and yes, I, I, there there have been a couple of nice studies. One came from Turkey, and one from the Mass General, uh, and 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 uh, you know, I think the issue with that though is it's largely focused on mechanical valves. So the good news for bioprostheses, as you know, is that HALT is really so classic. It's really got to be thickest at the base and have that meniscus shape. So if it's focal on the tip, it's thrombus. And the panis is almost always circumferential. So as it relates to panis versus thrombus, I think mechanical valves gets more complicated because the thrombus on mechanical valves can be more focal and bulbous. But this real halt is really, it's really got this classic appearance. It's, it's just shape. Yeah, it's classic shape, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question here and it's regarding, uh, is there a threshold for the, the gradient that you find an echo to go to a CT? Let's say after this, uh, this many millimeters of mercury, you go and have a CT because that gradient is worrying us. Is, is there a threshold or, or, or a value yeah. that we can? You know, I'd, I'd have to, uh, I mean, what, what our group follows is the guidance that came out, both Danny DeVere came out with a, uh, with a group a consensus document that was published in circulation, I think in 2018 or 2017. And then the European Society came out led by Davide Capadano uh, from, uh, from um, Catania. And they have one, I think it's a rise in gradient of 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, or five millimeters of mercury, a mean gradient rise, 10 millimeters would suggest uh, early change of structural valve. I believe to, to motivate the CT, I believe it's an increase in five, but I would call up those papers, uh, one in CERC and one in European Heart, but I believe it's five millimeter increase. Uh, but, you know, they define, it's so, so important as you say, because, you know, as we know, the historically we called structural valve degeneration uh, freedom from reoperation, right? So if you didn't reoperate, they didn't have structural valve degeneration. We know now, of course, that there are many patients who are too high risk for surgery who died of valve degeneration. So now we really rely on echo, you know, rising echo gradients or mean gradients above 20 to help us identify patients. Uh, but the key there, as you know, is really having a good baseline echo because understanding the baseline EOA, the baseline gradient, and, the, and whether or not the patient has patient prosthesis mismatch is essential as you're gonna follow these patients to make sure uh, that you can identify structural valve degeneration, but you also don't overcall it. Okay, okay. Now, going to the mitral valve. So what, what you have shown us is that the measurement, the, the size of the aortic valve annulus can be done without a specific software if you follow certain steps and you be really careful. We have a software for that, but but anyway, you need it. Um, and, and measuring the annulus for the mitral valve can also be done without a specific software, finding out where the fibers, thing, the D-shape uh, method. But yeah. trying to figure it out, trying to figure out the LVOT, this yeah. new LVOT concept, which we have been reading about, um, and we are always looking at the same pictures and it's like, how do we do those measurements? So we, we kind of imagine this and that, because we don't have a specific software uh, to simulate the, the mitral valve. So what we do is we measure the annulus, we go a little bit, so how, how many millimeters will go to, to the ventricle and then try to figure out the direction of the LVOT, this and that. So to make it short, do you have a specific software to measure, the to, to calculate this neo LVOT? Well, there are ways of doing it. And, you know, I think if you would welcome, we would get on a webinar uh, next week, just amongst the imagers, and we can walk you through using uh, just basic multiplanar tools. Certainly for valve and valve, uh, 
and valve and ring, you know, native of uh, uh, timber, but those are less common. Uh, they can be done by essentially because keep in mind for valve and valve, the mechanism of occlusion is of LVOT obstruction is similar to aortic valve and valve mechanism. It's really the surgical valve, not the transcatheter valve that's causing the occlusion because similarly, you know, you're, op you're, you're opening up the surgical valve leaflets of the mitral prosthesis and creating that. And then also measuring the so-called skirt LVOT by atrializing. So let's, let's I'll sh we'll walk through it step by step. But, you know, clearly having those post-processing tools make it easier. But we, there are ways of doing it and mostly exactly as you described, but essentially marching your way down from the trigone and the tip of the posts and then providing a, a plane that's perpendicular to the stent posts of the mitral valve. But I'll send a link with times and we'll, we'll get on a webinar and we'll walk through it step by step as well. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, in case of, I mean, so, so, some of those patients go to MitraClip, right? Not right. to a lot of um, How useful is CT to plan a MitraClip? Yeah. So it's interesting you ask that. Uh, what we do at our site is everyone with mitral uh, uh, has a, that's being considered for intervention has a CT. So we're very blessed that way because we can then have a really good discussion about whether repair is possible for degenerative MR, if they plan on doing a clip, or we use the Edwards clasp, or whether they're considering doing potentially a transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Uh, so we're able to learn about a lot of these things. Now the role specifically, if you've decided the patient has uh, prolapse and you're gonna clip this patient, or the patient has FMR and you wanna clip, uh, the role of CT is modest. CT can help us by looking at left ventricular volumes because we know from co-apt, you know, versus mitra FR, some patients derive better, greater benefit than others. And I think understanding LV size as it relates to the severity of MR can be helpful. We saw in, in, in mitra FR that, you know, when the ventricle is so big uh, and I think it can add to echo, so that's helpful. We look at left atrial volume sometimes. We look at uh, tissue characteristics of the mitral valve leaflet. Is there calcium? Is there MAC? But really, obviously, uh, the procedure itself and, and most of it beyond that is, is really echo-based for the, for the flipping procedures. Okay. And going beyond this is we're trying to teach other people about this. I mean, we were trying to learn ourselves, of course, of course before, oh, yeah. and yeah. Other, motivate others to this. What do you do with your radiology residents, yeah. your cardiac fellows that do a rotation with you? How long do they stay with you in that basic rotation? And right. that, I mean, to, to expose radiology residents to maybe go to cardiovascular imaging, which isn't, I mean, not, not many of them go to cardiovascular imaging, uh -huh. but um, how, how, how long do they, I mean, how long is that rotation that they do with you? And also for cardiology fellows, because they can also end up going to cardiovascular imaging. Yeah. It's pretty funky, you know. Yeah, that's such a, such a great question. Our, our radiology fellows, uh, uh, residents do one month minimum. They have a choice to do two. It's clearly not enough to do structural, to become expert in advanced structural. Uh, we do feel that within a month, they can be a level two, uh, you know, supporter of a lab for coronary CT. Uh, maybe not the, the site expert, but you know, do a good job around coronary CT and aortic uh, TAVR, routine TAVR, with some little bit of exposure to uh, aortic valve and valve, but probably not enough. Our, our interventional cardiology fellows come spend three months with us, which is great. Uh, they spend three months uh, out of two years, at least doing coronary CT, uh, doing plaque, doing FFR CT, doing structural. It's beautiful because we learn so much from them, you know, because it's great to look at coronary atherosclerosis, stenosis, and even non-invasive physiology. But if you don't know how they're gonna intervene what procedure they're going to do? Are they going to use rotoblation, or they're going to do lithotripsy, or or how you would stent it? We we learn a lot together. And the interventional fellows, when they originally came, they thought only for structural, but they love learning about the coronaries because I think most interventionalists now realize that coronary CT is going to help an interventionalist do their job way better. You know, you go to the cath lab with a fluoroscopic angle, you know the length of the lesion, you know the type of the plaque, you, uh, you know, are able to really plan your intervention instead of going to the cath lab, you know, and just trying to figure it out on the go. And, and I, I think they're seeing that there's a lot of opportunity 
from using CTA, not just for diagnosis, but to plan coronary intervention, never mind structural. Okay, so I think we're in time, just to keep it uh, the way we promised. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Leipzig. I mean, it's been an honor to have you here. Um, thank it's you. You've been very generous to share all your with us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much. much. Be safe, be healthy, and if and let's arrange a time to go through that approach, and, and hopefully I'll come visit you and have some really delicious Colombian food one day. So uh, be well, stay well. You have it. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Leipzig.